So we're going to get started. I'm going to, you've probably already heard me say this this morning, but I'm going to say it again. My name is Carrie Forbes. I am one of the um, library liaisons for the College of Nursing. I am the liaison for the undergraduate and baccalaureate programs. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to leave the um, you muted during the presentation. However, Amanda Haberstro, our liaison for graduate programs, is going to help with a little bit of the presentation, and she's also going to be monitoring chat. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, I want you to ask during the presentation, and I will pause and answer while we are going through this so that we can kind of stay um, within the section we're at. So please go ahead, and if you have any questions while I'm going through the presentation, just go ahead and um, add that to the chat, and Amanda will let me know if I don't see something or if I've missed something. So before we begin, I am going to send out a poll here at the beginning. So you should see a poll pop up here in just a minute. Okay, so I've got a poll up, and I started it more quickly than I meant to. But you've got about five minutes to look at these questions. Um, I just want to get a feel of how how you are feeling and um, see what your current concerns might be about APA 7th edition. Okay, go ahead and close this poll. And so if you were wondering which of the um, wondering which of the answers is correct for number three, which of the citations is correct. It's actually number three for seventh edition, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So um, we actually had three or four right answers there, so that's pretty awesome. We are starting this is APA seventh edition, tips, tricks, and tabs. We are going to cover, this is what we're going to cover today, um, new and notable changes, student papers, professional papers, Differences in language, references, in-text citations, and then uh, we'll do additional Q&A at the end. But like I said, I want you to ask questions throughout the presentation today. We'll try to keep it at an hour, um, or we've got about 45 minutes now, uh, but it might take a little bit longer. So if you'll stick around a few extra minutes, that would be great too. And let's just talk about the, uh, let's look at the, the basic print book itself. So the print book, which um, I don't know if any of you can see my face right now. I'm not sure if you can or not. But I'm looking at my, my printed spiral bound book here. And you notice that it has tabs, which is fantastic. Um, the only thing I don't, don't like about the tabs is it does not have the chapter numbers on them. So if that's important to you, you'll want to just write the chapter numbers on your little tabs. I actually did that. Um, I think this will be a lot easier to flip through than your old versions than with APA 6. I have already gotten a huge amount of use from my spiral bound book. I think you will too. But it's also available in paperback and in hardcover and also as an ebook. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. It's also going to be available in multiple languages. Um, so I don't think. There might be a Spanish edition available now, but I'm not sure. Um, but those will be to come in the future. There's also expanded student-specific resources. There are guidelines for ethical and bias-free writing, which Amanda is going to share with us later. And there are over 100 new reference examples. And many of those examples are nursing-focused and health science-focused. So I'm really, really excited about that. I think you will be, too. And, um, and sharing that with your students. So to tell you a little bit about some online resources you can use, we're going to um, visit the APA blog itself. So this is the APA website. Um, it looks very different than it did previously. And they actually have a lot of free resources that you can see here. This is the academic writer tutorial. And it has this overview of APA. It's sort of going through what we're going to go through today, except that um, it might not be quite as thorough. It doesn't have all the examples we're going to show you. But if you wanted your students to go through this and have a uh, good idea 
of um, so that you know that they've actually looked through this this information. You could have them um, screenshot this for you, the academic writer tutorial up here in the corner. When they get to 100%, you could have them screenshot that for you and email it to you so you know that they've at least looked at this. And um, they, if they've looked through it, hopefully they have some sort of an idea of the new um, information here. So this is just academic writer tutorial, and we just got to this through the APA style blog, and we went to instructional aids. And I'm going to be sending all of you this um, slide and all of these websites that we went to so you can get to this as well um, once we've completed this. So again, this is free instructional information from the APA style blog. So along with that tutorial, and they also have like webinars that are um, hosted on YouTube. They also have handouts and guides. One of the things we're going to look at today is they have this student paper guide and this quick reference guide. And these are all free. You could get to them right now. Oh, they have a new one. Um, the six steps to proper citation. Oh, that's cool. That's brand new. So as you can see, they're going to be adding to this. Um, they will have continual resources. Right now they have two sample papers available. And in the future, they're going to have additional sample papers. And these are full papers, not just bits and pieces, so that students can see what a full paper should look like. So I'm super excited about um, all of the stuff here. So um, again, these are just some of the free resources that are available. And they haven't made it so that your students shouldn't buy the book at all, but they definitely give them some really handy stuff to use in addition to the book. I actually have this quick reference guide here printed, and I cut out the little um, area about the journal and um, taped it to my monitor, so I have this really super quick reference. Okay, so that's the APA um, site itself and the free offerings it has there. One other thing I'll point out to you is their blog. This is the new um, APA 7th edition style blog. This replaces the 6th edition blog. Um, and they have, they're basically sharing this as a way to, um, if they have an answer that for some reason is not included in, excuse me, in the book. For example, the other day I had a student ask me um, how to cite a patient handout, a, a um, clinical patient handout for a student or for one of their patients, and we couldn't really figure it out. We, we kind of had an idea, and I was able to email this team, um, and they have their information on these posts so that you can connect with them. And I emailed them. It took them about two days, but they did get back to me and help me figure out um, what they suggested the best way to cite that. So this is going to be a place where they save all of that information. So you can sort of think of the blog as an ongoing uh, supplement to the book. Okay, so let's get back to the presentation. So these are the free uh, resources available through APA. Don't forget we also have our um, guides here at the library. And this is one that I will have updated with a lot more information in the coming weeks um, so that by, uh, hopefully by summer and definitely by fall, you can send your students to this page as well to help them, and it should be super helpful if they don't have the actual physical book. So that will also be available to you. Um, and then, of course, they have the ebook, which I'm going to show you really quickly. You can have the option to buy the ebook, but uh, this is what it looks like. This is their website, or actually, this is a vendor website called uh, Vital Source. And it um, is a place where a lot of it's a place where a lot of other textbooks are housed that you can buy here online and use online. However, if you're looking at this, you'll notice that it says expires in 337 days. So that means for this particular book, I only have a one-year subscription to this content. So they have a couple of options. You can buy. Um, you can buy like a Kindle book version, except you would use it um, on an app from Vital Source, so you could download it to your computer and use it on your computer, and that does not expire. You can use that forever. 
Um, you get up to four devices to put that on. So they do have an ebook option. It's just not available through like Amazon um, or Books a Million or any of those other online retailers that you're familiar with. So that is how you can. I'm just going to show you a little bit about what it looks like if you wanted to use it here online. Um, this is basically what it looks like. This is chapter 10, my favorite chapter, the reference example. It, the, it basically looks like this in the apps as well, um, if you have, if you're concerned about that. This is sort of what it looks like. You have the option to change uh, the text size, the font, um, the, the coloring, that type of thing, the margins, the height between the lines, uh, just like you would in your Kindle. It shows you the chapters right here, sort of uh, to the left, that middle column. And then if you wanted to search the entire book, there's a little magnifying glass here on the left. And you could say, oh, let's look for a blog or a blog post. And you can see it divides the results by the, the chapters. And then if we click here under reference examples for blog posts, we can see here, this is how you would now cite a blog post. Uh, just a couple of things. Just to reiterate, you'll see here that it has the actual blog post. You'll see that it is uh, live so that if it is in your paper, um, it's now available. You can leave it as a live link. Um, and it also shows the date that it was written. It does not show the retrieval date. Um, and it does not show retrieved from. And this is how you would do your citations. It shows you right there in the text how you would um, cite this in your paper. So that's just a little bit about the book online and how you can uh, use it. You can bookmark, you can highlight, you can add notes. Um, there's lots of little things you can do with the online version. And it's great on your phone, on your iPad, anything like that. So um, I am a fan of that other than the, um, it, their online version will only give you one year access. So moving on, we are going to, our next slide is called New and Notable, but we're going to move to a handout that I've given to other classes. If you just uh, email me your name after the class, I will send you this handout that we're going to look at. So these are the newest changes. So you'll notice, number one, you'll notice in a book, uh, we no longer need the publisher location. The publisher is now also called um, the source. So what we used to call the publisher is now the source. Um, and that makes sense in the um, because you're now showing where you retrieved the information, not just who published it. So that's very useful. So as, as you can see in this example, it's just sharing Simon & Schuster. And there's no need to put New York, New York. Number two, for in-text citations, starting from the very first one, you no longer need to put up to seven people or however um, up to seven in the within the text. You only have to put the first person. Um, if there are two authors, you do put two people. But if there are more than two authors, you only put at all. So that's a big change. I think that's super handy. And I think that will really help students um, instead of trying to figure out how many authors you're supposed to put in here. And, um, why does it change from the first citation to the second citation? So now they're all the same. However, uh, number three here, you see that in the end, this is where you actually add the huge amount of authors. So in the end references, you will add up to 20 authors in a citation. You will put the first 19, and then you will put the very last, whereas before you would only put seven, I believe. I believe you only put seven before. Um, so now this is where that author gets their recognition. So up to 19 in the very beginning of that uh, reference listing and the very last one so that you have a total of 20 authors listed. Number uh, four here, the DOI is now listed as a full website. So it shows the full URL. Um, you can also use shortened DOIs, and you can see here the, the um, link to shortdoi.org. 
And what that does is if your student has a long DOI, like the one listed here in the example, they can put that DOI into shortdoi.org and it will shorten them for them. Um, it, if there has already been one that's been created, they will give them the one that's already been created. So there's only one short DOI, just like there's one DOI for each um, journal article. So that's an option they have. Along, if they're doing um, websites, for example, there are some journals that still, for whatever reason, don't use DOI and don't have that listed. Um, you can just use the website as well. And you can also use shortening, link, um, shortening sites like Bitly or Owly to do the shortening um, for websites as well. You would just need to tell your students that they really need to double check those links to make sure they're working correctly. Number five, retrieved from. You generally don't need to add that anymore in most website references. The only ones you would need that for is for, um, for things like Wikipedia or dictionaries where they don't archive the old material. So um, Wikipedia, every time they change something, they don't have an archive of the old um, article. So that's when you would use retrieved from. As you can see in this example, it's showing an article that was shared on BBC News website. And as you can see, as part of the source, um, they have listed BBC News. So you can see that here, that's kind of acting like the publisher. And you can also see one other major change here is that for seventh edition, um, the titles of websites, so the title of the blog post, the title of the article, that you're reading on BBC News is now going to be italicized, and that is new. Moving on, one space after a period. I know everyone's excited. I am anyway. Um, I think most of us were already doing this, but now um, that is in the book, but it does say that is also left up to the discretion of the instructor. So if you don't want them to do one period, you can certainly tell them, no, you have to do two. Another big change uh, you'll see in, under number B here is there is a huge section on bias-free language um, along with updated grammar and language guidelines. One example of how APA is striving to use language that is inclusive um, is they are accepting the use of the singular they as a gender-neutral pronoun, a gender-neutral description. So in this example, you could see in APA 6, it would have been preferred to say, a researcher's career depends on how often he or she is cited. Um, we hope that's not the only reason that they have a good career, but um, now you can see in APA 7th edition, it's often, um, it can now be accepted as a researcher's career depends on how often they are cited. So that can mean a he, a she, or someone who prefers not to use um, or prefers a gender neutral uh, pronoun. And Amanda will talk much more about this later on. Number, or I'm sorry, letter C here, you will see that in student papers, they no longer need a running head. Yay, no more confusing students. Uh, they don't have to have a running head. All they need is that flush right page number on every single page. So they don't have to have a different running head on the first page, and then you take out the running head part in the second page. They don't have to worry about that. As far as paper layouts, I know some instructors are um, very concerned about the heading levels and um, the titles of different parts of the paper. So that has also changed slightly in seventh edition. Um, for other people, this has not been as big of a deal, but one thing you will see is that many of the headings are now um, in bold. So that's a big change just to help with readability and accessibility for online papers. And the last two things I wanted to point out as the new and notable changes, APA is now accepting up to uh, five fonts here. I think there's actually one more included that's not in this list. Um, but now your students can use other fonts that are also deemed as um, equally legible and widely available. And all of these fonts still also include special characters like math symbols or Greek lettering. <clears throat> 
Um, and one more thing I wanted to point out is that APA also makes it very clear that for other types of mediums, in addition to articles and books, um, they're telling you who you need to add as the author. So, for example, in a film, you would say the director is the author of that film. Um, so they're very clear about who needs to be the author on any particular um, on any particular medium, um, whether it's online or through a video at home, that type of thing. So I think they've made that super clear. Okay, so we're going to bring in a middle poll. So this is just kind of to review a few of the things that we talked about um, over the past few minutes. Okay. All right, great. So as you can see, which of the following is correct? And those of you who chose number three were correct. Um, we showed a shortened link for this book. And I, I actually meant to, I don't think I mentioned this during the presentation, and I meant to, that books also now have DOIs and websites. And if you can find them, if they are available, um, you can add those to those reference um, listings at the end of the paper. How many authors? There are 20, um, up to 20 being listed. And for the end, uh, that last question, singular they is now being accepted. So um, that was a false question. Using the term singular they is not accepted. It is. It is accepted as a gender neutral pronoun. So I'm going to close out that poll. All right, and let's go back to our presentation. We are going to let's, we're going to quickly review student papers. As you can see on the first page, there is of course no running head. Uh, they only have page numbers in the upper right hand corner. The title of the paper is now in bold. And now they have a very clear distinction as to what they want listed on that front cover page. They show that they want the affiliation. So they're going to share that they are a member of um, East Carolina University or student at East Carolina University. Then they're going to show their course number, Nursing 101. Uh, then they show the instructor and then the due date of the paper. So as you look at this PowerPoint, I do want to point out to you in the bottom lower left corner, there's a corresponding page number. That is for the APA manual for the seventh edition so that when you go back through this um, presentation, you can go back to the book to find it within the book. So this is the first page of the student paper. All following pages, again, they just have that number uh, in the upper right-hand corner. One big thing to note on student papers is that now they do not ask for them to have an abstract or sample, um, or keywords, I'm sorry, not samples, um, an abstract or keywords. That is up to the discretion of the instructor. If you want them to have that information, you need to make sure, um, yes, and the, the due date on the student paper is the date that the, um, the paper is actually due. But student papers do not have an abstract or keywords unless you want them to. That is part of the professional paper. The headings are just slightly different. You'll notice they are bolded. Um, and again, the, the pages in the book are more clear about exactly how those headers are laid out. Moving on for professional papers, they do have a running head. However, they do not have the title running head. So you don't have to include that. They all have the, the uh, shortened running head and the page number. So all of your pages will be the same as far as the header. Um, other than that, there are a few changes in how you as professionals would put um, the title. You would put the title, you would put your name, and then you would put your current affiliation. And then at the bottom of the paper, you might include your ORCID ID. Um, and if you have questions about that, Amanda and I can help you set up your ORCID ID. It's kind of like your personal DOI. It's a way for you and for anybody else who's interested in your work to see um, an ongoing live account of your presentations, your papers, your writing, um, and the places that you have worked. So if you don't have an ORCID ID, we really um, uh, encourage you to get one and we can help you set that up. It's super easy and free. And down at the author note is also where you would add any changes of affiliation. So if you worked at a different university, um, 
you could do that as well. And you could list it there, and you could also list any disclosures or acknowledgments there. All right, so let's move on. Other changes in professional papers, not a whole lot really, other than just that um, they are bold um, as far as different sections of the paper and the levels are slightly different. But overall, there's not a ton of differences. And like I can see Amanda pointing out here, um, you do want to make sure that um, whatever way you want your student to write your paper, understand that other instructors may just have them following the student guidelines, or other instructors may just have them following the professional guidelines. So whatever you do, just make sure that um, they are very clear on what you want them to follow, whether you want them to follow strictly by the book or whether you um, want them to follow student guidelines, but they, you want them to have the abstract and keywords. So just make sure that they are very clear on that because it will be confusing um, if different instructors ask for different requirements. So now Amanda is going to share a little bit about um, the differences. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, is that right? Yes, Amanda is going to share with us about differences in language and um, guidelines for reducing bias. Okay, good morning. Um, so, one of the greatest things about the uh, seventh edition um, are the chapters. To be perfectly honest, the layout is very easy to follow. Um, the chapters are written to uh, read kind of like a textbook. It's, I mean, you could you could assign chapters for reading. It's really it's really nice. Um, so this slide is going to tell you basically where you can find um, chapters on uh, certain writing expectations and standards. Um, so they have dedicated an entire chapter now, chapter three, on JARS, the Journal Article Reporting Standards. Um, chapter nine, if you are, you know, if they have legal references, that, that's going to handle all of that. I don't know how common that is going to be for your students, but know that that's there. Um, chapter 12 is excellent if you are um, wanting your students to understand what the um, process to go from writing to publication is like. Um, that might be particularly useful if you're trying to help them evaluate their papers that they're seeing and the results from their um, searches. Um, it's also valuable for you, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, so that you can kind of keep track of all of that for yourself as well. Um, then there are um, great, great resources on um, just the actual writing style, grammar. Um, chapter 4 is an excellent resource. So, um, you know, we really, we're seeing the style manual not just as like a best reference, but also as um, something that you can have um, as an actual textbook, you can actually explain it to your students. I certainly do encourage you to do that. Um, and as Carrie is saying, yes, these chapters are written in, um, you know, what we call in health literacy world plain language. You don't have to be um, an APA expert to understand. Um, so I feel like they've really done a good job of appealing to their audience. It's wonderful. Um, and then we've got a couple of additional. So we've got chapter one that really focuses on scholarly writing. What's the difference between scholarly writing and um, just sort of day-to-day -day communication, that kind of thing, um, to help writers really understand how to elevate their language depending on what their um, needs are. Um, and then I'm going to start talking about chapter five in a little bit more detail next, which is um, an entire chapter dedicated to bias-free language. The APA has um, really done a great job here on um, helping writers to understand that um, socially, generally, we are now trying to become more inclusive in our language. And so there's a way to do that that would also meet standards of the APA style. So. Um, so some of this that we're that we're looking at, they have this wonderful kind of introductory paragraph that I think is so great. Um, but what Carrie has bolded here um, is really kind of the, the, the key to it. So um, the APA um, 
takes the stance that it is unacceptable to use constructions that might imply prejudicial beliefs or perpetrate biased assumptions against persons on the basis of age, disability, gender, participation in research, racial or ethnic identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, or some combination of these or other personal factors. Instead, authors should use affirming and inclusive language. So basically, the idea is we're going away from these um, dehumanizing labels, and we're trying to rehumanize the people that we are writing about, trying to keep in mind the person um, rather than a condition or rather than um, their status or anything like that, because those labels can really bias our um, our writing and and may cause our reader to jump to conclusions that maybe we don't intend for them to. So having that more inclusive language certainly helps our message come across more clearly. Um, and additionally, it is more welcoming and inclusive for readers of all identities, right? So we don't want to exclude anybody just because um, we have exclusive, uh, exclusionary language, I should say, okay? Um, so Carrie mentioned this earlier, um, that one of probably the biggest changes that we're very excited about is that APA now endorses the use of singular they. Um, this is something of a former English teacher. It took me a long time, I'll be honest, took me a very long time to come around to the idea of they as a singular pronoun. Um, I used to mark up my students' papers anytime they said they, and I would write he or she, he or she. Well, that's not how it is anymore. We don't live in a world of there's only he or she. We live in a world of he, she, they, whatever whatever pronoun an individual uses to um, to identify themselves, that's the pronoun we should be using when we're writing. So um, we strongly encourage you um, to allow your students to use that language too, um, because it is now, according to the APA, considered standard. Um, we want to be sensitive about labels that we're using um, to describe people. Um, we don't want to have, in this example, um, we use the example of schizophrenics. Um, you know, it carries a connotation, right? So we're trying not to already bias our reader against our subject. Um, so instead, we use um, uh, people first language, identity first language, and just kind of keep that person in mind. So people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, that kind of thing. Um, same with uh, racial and ethnic, ethnic identities. Um, so using proper nouns, so capitalizing them, um, indigenous people, aboriginal people, um, you'll see um, for African American, of course, that's capitalized, black is capitalized, um, Hispanic is capitalized, that kind of thing. So we want to make sure that we are um, following that, um, that standard, okay? All right, so this is um, kind of the the whole the whole point, I guess. We're using descriptive phrases, um, trying to move away from labeling um, subjects. So instead of saying, um, you know, I surveyed the poor. <laughs> okay, we want to talk about I surveyed people living in poverty. Okay, because the word poor has a connotation, and we don't want to make any kind of a suggestion about the people that we're working with. Right. So I surveyed people living in poverty because that's what we did. We talk to humans, right, who have a certain condition, right? Um, they're also encouraging exact age ranges. So we're trying to move away from very broad categories like the elderly. What does that mean? You know, um, when I was five, somebody who was 40 felt elderly. And now that I'm almost 40, that doesn't feel elderly anymore, <laughs> you know? So we're trying to get away from broad labels and we want to use exact age ranges. So if you looked at a population um, who maybe you would think over 65, but really the people who participated in your study were from 65 to 75, then use that range, say 65 to 75 year olds, okay? Um, for sexual orientation, this one is a little trickier because these labels are constantly changing. So what we are telling the students um, and what we encourage you and, and hope that you also will tell them is it is important that they are using the labels that the people are using on themselves, okay? So um, you may have um, 
folks who prefer the labels that are now considered kind of outdated, like LGBT is considered outdated. Um, it is now LGBTQ+, um, LGBTQIA, um, IA+, you know, that sort of thing. So the, the best thing to do is to use the language that your research participants or that the subjects in the studies that you're reading use the language that those individuals use to describe themselves. Um, for instance, if, um, if you are interviewing um, people of different um, racial identities and they use the word black to describe their race, then you use the word black. Don't use the word African American, okay? Um, if you are interviewing a woman who identifies as a lesbian, she uses the word lesbian, then you use the word lesbian. So that's kind of our rule of thumb here. Um, we're trying to make sure that um, people feel that their language is validated and, um, and that we are being as inclusive and welcoming as possible. Okay. Thanks. Great, thanks Amanda. Sure. All right, so now we're going to move on to um, actual references themselves and how we create those. And one of my uh, favorite things about this new APA book and how they have set it up is they've tried to make it as understanding, um, as visually understanding as possible. They've set up ways so that you can visually connect with um, where this information is in the reference itself. Um, so it's basically all of the same information, except it's, it's just updated. So we still have the author, so part of our fab four here, um, we still have the date, which would be next. The title is next, just like it has always been. And then the very end, we're just renaming source as opposed to publisher because we're including where you would find or retrieve the work as opposed to just the company that published the work. Um, so that's just really the one big clarification. So I've shown you this reference before. This is this free reference that's available on the APA site. Um, and the website, again, is right here in the slide as well um, so that you and your students can find it. And this just breaks it down. Basically, again, you have the author, the year, title, um, and then all of this bottom area here, all of this would be considered your source. So you have the name of the periodical, volume issue, page numbers, and then the DOI or website. One thing I really like in the book is they show how to find this information. So if you're looking at um, a, a paper that it kind of points out, okay, here's the title. This is where you would find your title area. Um, here's the author. This gives you the date right here under the name of the journal. And actually you can't quite see it here, but the DOI is actually listed underneath there as well. So it tells you how to find all of that information. So looking at uh, references specifically, starting with journals, again, they have this great, um, uh, this great graph here, a great table showing students exactly how to lay out this information. Um, and as you can see with this corresponding example, this is a journal article with a DOI. So it's showing the DOI here at the end of the reference. Um, as you can see, everything else though is the same. It's the same as you would have done in APA 6. And <clears throat> one extra feature that APA 7 has included for every single example they give is how students do their citations, how they do their in-text citations. So that's a huge help and a huge bonus that um, I was extremely excited about. So you can See the examples here right up above um, each section of the book, and then they show how it can be listed in the paper. And again, they are showing that as a live link, which is now accepted. Uh, moving on here, I know you're, you know we're running short on time, so I will try to go through these briefly. Um, again, we already talked about those journal articles with 20 or more authors, or um, yeah, 21 or more authors. You show the first 20 here at the beginning, you end with that last author. Uh, so that's the one thing that's different. Um, a big difference for this particular example is that the DOI is using, they use a shortened DOI here. So uh, you can just see that that's a shorter version of the DOI and they use the short DOI website to do that. Next, um, 
they do have a difference between a journal article in press versus a, an online publication. Um, the big difference that I think, which is a little bit confusing, is that generally I think when you're looking at something in press, your, your student might actually have like a print copy, I don't know, that um, maybe the author sent them and so therefore they're using this impress version and that's why this doesn't have a website or a doi here um, that's the only thing i can really figure out to be honest with you otherwise if it's an advanced online publication um, you're actually listing that after the journal publisher you're, so here's the i'm sorry the journal title itself and then you say advanced online publication and add the doi um, so my guess is this is how most of your students are going to um, need to add these um, journal articles as a reference. And if they have any questions, they can ask, and I'll be happy to try to help them sort that out. One important thing that I get a question on a lot is, well, okay, so I used this paper, I used this article for my paper, uh, but at the time it was in press. Um, or online, and now it's actually in the journal. Which one am I supposed to add as my reference? You tell your students to use the paper they actually um, used when they were writing the paper. So if they were using the advanced online publication, that's what they need to cite, because as we know, that might be a little different than the actual um, published, um, finished article online. So they need to cite the actual information they were using. Moving on to books, um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, books are now including the DOI, and I'm going to see if I can show this to you in the book itself. Um, on the cover, or in the right inside the cover page, this will give me the next page here. And you can see a little bit how this book works. Uh, they're actually listing the DOI right here. I don't know if you can see my highlight or not. Um, but it's actually listed there in the book. And um, I've found other books probably from or since 2019 that are also including that in their um, copyright page on in the book. I, I will also say that while um, it's up to you whether you want your student to include that DOI for the book, if they can't find it, they can always go to the publisher site and find the page on the publisher um, that is just for uh, books. So you might, you'll probably want to tell them not to include the Amazon listing like that really might not be the most useful link for you, um, but books can also have a DOI now. So how about a book without a DOI? Let's say, um, let's just say that they use the book from one of the online databases. It's an ebook. They no longer have to tell you whether they looked at an ebook or a print book. Um, there's no difference. They just include the publisher at the end with no um, place. And if they have the DOI website, they can use it. They don't have to specify that this was an electronic book or an ebook. For um, edited books, same thing. You um, nothing really changes with that. You still use the editor um, area right next to the author. So not much has changed there. One thing I did point out is that in books. Um, online, especially that are always um, changing, or if they're reference books, a lot of times with reference, such as this Merriam Webster dictionary, you can see that Merriam Webster is the author. If the author is the same as the publisher, they do not need to include the publisher at the end of the reference. That is only true if it's the author. If it's listed just in the title, you would still list it here um, after or right before the website. But if it's the name of the author, they don't need to list it at the end. So you can see the difference there in the two citations. Moving on to social media, um, as you can see here, your source is actually the platform. So Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, that would be listed as the publisher or the source. So that's where that information is going. It's also important to note here, you can see in this first title, says my fellow UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador Kate Blanchett is, and then it shows image attached. That's showing you that they are actually referencing that image. 
so that's showing you exactly what they were referencing. They're wanting students to, um, if they're using this for anecdotal research, that they're showing that they were looking at the image or the hashtag or the emoji. Um, and this is where those things would be cited. You see here, infographic, video, that's how that would be cited. For a website, um, like we were just saying, the actual publisher, so in this case, this is an example of, a, of an article on CNN. Um, they list the name of the author who wrote the article. They list the date that the article was published. So this is not the retrieval date, but the date that the article itself says it was published, the title, and then the CNN as the platform um, or the publisher, and then the website. And then again, here are your parenthetical citations. And lastly, so I know we're getting really short on time here. Um, if you don't have an author, the book has a great um, table here to tell students exactly how to write out um, a reference list entry and an in-text citation in case they're missing something. And I think this is probably one of the most useful, um, I mean, the whole book is useful, but this is one of the greatest tables in there, I think. So just quickly reviewing in-text citations um, and direct quotes. As you can see, the book is really useful in giving them that information next to examples already. But otherwise, they do have this uh, great table showing them exactly how to list those citations, how to do it with a group author, um, how to do it from the first citation and onward. And most of that does not change unless it's a super huge title like the National Institute of Mental Health, which you would then shorten. Um, for direct quotes, it's pretty much the same as it was before, like it was in sixth edition. If it's fewer than, than 40 words, that's a short quote, and they just put the page that they found that information. Now, it is important to note if there are no page numbers, they, um, they just found this on a website, there's not, there are not pages. You would put the section, or you would put the paragraph number, or you can put both. If you want to be super specific, put both. Um, so that is how you would designate where that information is that you directly quoted from a website. 40 words or more is a block quote, and it still has it's just that same exact block quote. So no differences. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's where we're at. Um, you can see here I have um, a, if Amanda will add that survey link to this class, if, um, if you'll go ahead and take a survey for me, just to let me know um, if this was useful, that would help me out a whole lot. Um, and now, if, you, if anyone wants to unmute and ask questions, if you need to leave, that's perfectly okay. I know, um, I know you guys need to go, it's after 12. But if anyone has questions, please feel free to um, unmute and ask or ask in the chat. Um, I will probably be around another 10 minutes, so uh, if it, anyone just needs to go ahead and head on out, feel free. Thank you again, I know this is a long presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, just email me and Amanda. We'll be more than happy to help you sort it out and figure out how to set up these new citations and references. And thanks, I'm sorry, thanks again everybody for coming. Um, I will be having two more in-person um, classes here in Lopez for anyone who would like to attend, and I'll probably have a few in the summer and in the fall as well. So uh, feel free to either attend those if you still need more help um, or if anyone needs, um, you want to refer anyone else for additional help, we'll have additional classes. So thanks everyone for attending. No questions? Yeah, it looks okay. like um, we didn't have any additional questions in the chat. Thank okay. you all so much. Yes, Robin, happy Friday. Y'all enjoy your weekend. Yes. Thanks everybody. I hope you have a great weekend.